I'd like to thank Stuart for that introduction. Um, I'm here to talk about virtue. I know that the uh, session is, uh, the, the, the series of talks are about power, and we will touch on power briefly, and maybe in our conversation at the end we can come back to power. Um, but I'm primarily talking about virtue. And I'm going to start with, uh, I think the course of the talk, I'm going to refer once or twice to some Catholic philosophers. I'm going to start with a very great Catholic philosopher, Elizabeth Anscombe. So I think I'm going to start immediately by saying I am not a Catholic. In fact, I am an atheist. So I don't want you to think the fact that I'm repeatedly agreeing with Catholic philosophers implies that I agree with everything they think. Um, and I think we should start with a sense of who Elizabeth Anscombe was. She was married to a man called Peter Geach. They were both Catholics. Consequently, in those days, they had many children. They had, in fact, seven children. And one day, a small child was found wandering in the street outside their house, traffic passing by. So a sort of well-intentioned, responsible adult, seeing this, came up to the child and said, you know, where's, where's your house? The child pointed, they took the child along, knocked on the door. Peter Geach came to the door. The person said, I found this child in the street. I think you should look after your children carefully. They might get run over. And Geach peered at the child, turned around and cried into the house, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, come here for a moment. Is this one of ours? <laughs> so Elizabeth was an even less, not as much as Peter, but still she was an unworldly philosopher, I think we can say. And she wrote a famous essay in 1958 <clears throat> called Modern Moral Philosophy. And the point of that essay is to argue that there is no modern moral philosophy. That philosophers can no longer do moral philosophy because they no longer have the beliefs that are required to sustain a proper moral philosophy. And as far as Anscombe was concerned, there were two types of belief that would hold up a moral philosophy. One was a belief in Christianity, which would enable you to think of, uh, let's, would enable you to think of God as having issued commands that you were obliged to obey because they were commanded by God. This is the apotheosis of St. Thomas. He's standing between Plato and Aristotle. At his feet is the Islamic philosopher Averroes crushed not simply out of Islamophobia, though also surely out of Islamophobia, but also because Averroes taught the mortality of the soul. He denied the existence of a life after death. As far as Anscombe is concerned, St. Thomas had understood that there was a moral law that must be obeyed because it was a divine command. And behind that, uh, Anscombe believed in the teachings of Aristotle, which had been reworked by St. Thomas. And Aristotle had believed that to live a life of virtue, you had to embody certain qualities that you would learn to embody by practice. You had to have the right character. And the key sets of virtues were virtues that you could only have if you were an adult male living within a Greek polis. You needed to have courage, you needed to have justice, and so on. They were, in fact, virtues that Aristotle himself could not have because he was not a citizen of Athens, and so he could not be called into battle, and he could not display courage because, against Socrates, who said that even women could have courage, Aristotle said courage was simply something you showed on the battlefield. And if you weren't on the battlefield, you had no opportunity to show courage. So as far as Aristotle was concerned, virtue was a unique quality for adult Greek males living within cities, living within policies. And other people, women, slaves, children, could no more have virtue than animals could have. But if you had virtue, you knew that there were certain things that it was simply wrong to do. If you were on the battlefield, it was wrong to turn and run under any circumstances. You might be ordered to retreat, that's fine, but to turn and run would always be wrong. No person of courage could possibly do it. So as far as Anscombe, looking back to Aristotle and looking back to St. Thomas was concerned, the characteristic of a moral philosophy was that it said there are certain things that you must never do. And if you do them, you're acting wickedly. And she thought the characteristic of modern moral philosophy 
was that it was constantly equivocating about that. It was constantly saying, well, there are all sorts of circumstances in which you might have to do some things that look bad, but they're really all right because they have good outcomes. What she called consequentialist thinking, or I would call instrumental reasoning. Instrumental reasoning, she thought, was the opposite of morality. And utilitarians who said, do what produces the greatest happiness for the greatest number, were perfectly happy to kill people or lie or cheat or steal as long as it produced an outcome that was satisfactory. And in her view, this meant they had no moral philosophy at all. The next philosopher I want to touch on is Isaiah Berlin, who was a refugee to England, died in 1997. And Berlin adopted a view that Aristotle would have found, and St. Thomas would have found, and Elizabeth Anscombe would have found, entirely unimaginable. According to Berlin, it is a feature of human existence that there are many different types of good life. There are competing ideals that we might want to live according to, and you have to choose between them. And there is no right or wrong way of choosing between them. And as far as Berlin was concerned, the person who best exemplified the discovery of this fundamental truth was Machiavelli. I'm using there the frontispiece of an edition of Machiavelli for from 1550, because that's the earliest picture we've got of what Machiavelli looked like. Uh, anything, before, anything that pretends to be a representation of Machiavelli is actually based upon that. Machiavelli, Berlin said, had understood that if you're going to do politics, occasionally you'd have to kill people. If you're going to kill, do politics, of course, a certain amount of lying was part of the trade. If you were going to do politics, it was important to look religious, but actually to act irreligious. Machiavelli, Berlin said, had understood that to be a virtuous politician, to live the life of a politician, was quite different from that of living the life of a good ordinary human being, a good citizen, and utterly different from living the life of a Christian or a saint. The choice that Machiavelli had made in advocating the political life couldn't be found to be wrong. It was just a choice that some people might not want to make. So as far as Berlin was concerned, there were fundamental choices, competing forms of good life, and this has created what some people have called tragic liberalism, because if you made one choice, you had to give up the other. So if you became a politician, Machiavelli famously is supposed to have said that he loved Florence more than his own soul. To choose to be a Florentine politician was to choose to damn your own soul. That was the tragic choice you had to make if you were going to go into politics. And that way of thinking was taken up by Thomas Hobbes 140 years after Machiavelli. And what Hobbes basically does is he takes the notion that Machiavelli had laid out that states are in constant ruthless competition with each other, a competition in which there are only winners and losers, there can be no compromises, there can be no peace deals, there are only temporary alliances. And Hobbes simply said, that's not just true about states, that's true about all of our lives. That is what our lives are, an endless competition for success. Now, we need not to kill each other all the time, and so we need to institute a power which will control us, but fundamentally that competition will go on all the time. And all we want is success. Two words are entering the English language in the world of Hobbes for the first time. One word, I was astonished when I discovered this. I couldn't believe it was true. I ended up spending a great deal of time trying to prove myself wrong. One word is competition. Competition, I just assumed, was a word that people had always had. I tried to think of alternative words that meant the same thing as competition. I tried various ones, but all of them turned out to be roughly contemporary with competition. They come into use in the 1630s. When Hobbes is talking about a world of constant competition, he's talking about something that's new for people, not new necessarily in reality, but certainly new in terms of people understanding that that's the way the world is. The other word that's new that shapes Hobbes' understanding of the world, but Hobbes never uses, it's used about Hobbes himself, 
is the word selfish. There, people talk about self-love before. They talk about looking after your own interests before. But the word selfish is new, and people say immediately of Hobbes, he's a very selfish sort of person. Because he says, your own interests are the only interests that count. And if you want to look after somebody else, it's only because you formed an alliance with them. You want to benefit from, you form a company, you form some sort of agreement together, but you're only interested in them doing well because it'll help you do well. And so famously, Hobbes said, this is the origin of the idea of the pursuit of happiness, which is the founding idea of America. Hobbes says, the felicity of this life consisteth not in the repose of a mind satisfied, which is what ancient philosophers, the Epicureans had said, happiness lay in tranquility. Not in the repose of a mind satisfied, for there is no such finis ultimus, no such utmost aim, nor summum bonum, no such greatest good, as is spoken of in the books of the old moral philosophers. By the old moral philosophers, he means those great men, Plato and Aristotle, who are now being treated as if they're the rubbish of history. Nor can a man any more live whose desires are at an end than he whose senses and imaginations are at a stand. Felicity is a continual progress of the desire from one object to another. The attaining of the former being still but the way to the latter. So every day, you want something new. Every day, you want more of what you had before. Every day, you get up saying, yesterday I had a good time. Good time. Today, I want to have a better time. There is no point at which you can relax and say, I've got enough. Because, of course, in a world of competition, you can never know that someone won't come and take it away from you. So you must always accumulate. Power, he calls it, that you want to accumulate. But power means for him friendship, because friendship, friends are allies. It means wealth, and it means political power. And Hobbes was drawing, apart from Machiavelli, who I think is very important to Hobbes, he was drawing on a couple of other people. He was drawing on Lucretius. This is a um, uh, manuscript of Lucretius. Lucretius was rediscovered in the Renaissance, having been lost throughout the Middle Ages. Only one or two manuscripts survived, and then they started copying him. This is a manuscript of 1483. And Lucretius was an Epicurean. Lucretius dies in 55 BC, so he's uh, before Cicero, for example. Lucretius was an Epicurean who said, therefore, that life consists in the pursuit of pleasure. Pleasure is all that counts, but what you want is pleasures that can't be taken away from you. And if what you want is pleasures that can't be taken away from you, the real thing that you want is inward tranquility. So that even if you have a toothache, you can feel tranquil, and you can feel to yourself, it's not really happening to me, right? And then, even if you're on the rack, people later like Cicero comes along and says, well, if you're a proper Epicurean, you're going to have to accept. If you're a follower of Lucretius, you're going to have to accept. Even if you're being tortured, you can be happy because you can be tranquil, because you can say to yourself, this is really just something passing by, right? Impossible in Hobbes' world. In Hobbes' world, if it's happening to you, it's happening to you. If you're feeling pain, you are not happy. There is no way of escaping from suffering in Hobbes' world into some in interior mental space of the sort that the Epicureans recommended. And Hobbes also, Hobbes spends most of his time attacking Aristotle and referring to him in a contemptuous way. But he published in 1637, I've only chosen this later edition because it's got a picture of Hobbes on it. Uh, he published in 1637 a summary of Aristotle's book on rhetoric. And if you read Aristotle's book on rhetoric, you find in it discussion of morality. And the discussion of morality is very un-Aristotelian. Aristotle says there that if you're trying to defend someone who's under attack, you should say, well, uh, he may have got into trouble, but he was trying to do the best for you. He wasn't looking after his own interests. He says you should say, the greatest virtues are those which are most useful to others. Aristotle suddenly sounds like an 18th century utilitarian. So Hobbes was happy with the Aristotle of the rhetoric and reprinted bits of that because this wasn't the Aristotle of virtue. This was the Aristotle of how you sell yourself to the public. And he thought that was a perfectly sensible Aristotle. 
And this Hobbesian move, which consists of the invention of human beings as entirely selfish and self-interested and hedonistic and entirely preoccupied with the pursuit of power in order to maximize their own pleasure, this Hobbesian move becomes a paradigm, a standard, against which every philosopher for the next 200 years has to measure themselves. And they measure themselves by either agreeing with it or by saying, well, I sort of agree with it and I sort of disagree with it and it's a little more complicated than it might seem, which is a way of fundamentally agreeing with it, I would say. So Spinoza, for example, who comes after Hobbes, publishes his Ethics posthumously in 1677. What does Spinoza say in the Ethics? Spinoza says in the Ethics that human beings are entirely selfish in their behavior, that they act only in their own interests, that their behavior is governed by an internal law, which is the pursuit of their own pleasures. And that is what we are, and that is what we must be, and there is no alternative to that. So in fact, it, Spinoza's Ethics for Elizabeth Anscombe, as far as she's concerned, a Catholic philosopher like that, Spinoza's Ethics isn't a book of ethics at all. It's a book about the impossibility of ethics. And, and I think, broadly speaking, that's true. And the next, um, I'm not going to call him a philosopher, the next, he's an, he was an economist primarily, um, Albert Hirschman, who died uh, just, I think, last year or just this year. Hirschman was by profession a development economist, but he was somebody much more than that. He uh, was a very brave man who performed a wonderful function during the Second World War of helping people escape from Nazi-occupied France, for example. And Hirschman wrote a little book which came out in 1977 called The Passions and the Interests. This brings us into the world of Hobbes I've been talking about. Human beings according to Hobbes and the Hobbists, are driven by their passions and their interests. Reason, these people say, cannot determine our behavior because reasons don't provide you. I tell you, global warming is real. The temperature is going to rise. Dreadful things will happen. And you all get in your automobiles and you drive away and you behave as if I've said nothing because I've not given you a motivation for doing anything about it. If I say to you, think about your grandchildren, then I might be beginning to evoke a passion that's powerful and important to you, and it might actually change the way you behave. The Hobbist argument is that reason only ever tells you how to get what you already want. It is, Hobbes says, a form of calculation, like the calculation of a merchant doing his spreadsheet. He works out how he's going to make a profit. You work out through reason how you'll get what you already want. Reason will never make you want something you don't already want. So reason, where for Aristotle, we are governed by reason. We're rational animals. That's what we are. That's the definition of who we are. For Hobbes and the whole of moral philosophy after Hobbes for the next 200 years, we are governed by our passions. Hume famously says that reason is the servant of the passions. Hirschman's book is about how this new attitude to human motivation was used to develop arguments in favor of free enterprise, of capitalism, in the 17th century, before and after Hobbes. And a striking example of this is provided by a moral philosopher and a clergyman called Pierre Nicole who published some essays in 1671, which Locke had translated into English. Now, Nicole is what was called the Jansenist. And the thing about Jansenists was that they were strict Augustinians. They believed that we are, by our nature, profoundly corrupt and incapable of goodness. And therefore, our motives are always, always, except unless we're very, very lucky to be one of the saved, our motives are always corrupt. Fortunately, said Nicole, greedy, nasty people can be persuaded to do good things for each other. I go to my hotel, they provide me with a clean bed, they provide me with food and drink, they look after me beautifully, not because they care about me or because they're worried about my welfare, but because I'm paying the bill, or actually in this case, because the Chicago Humanities Center is paying the bill, even better. 
Corrupt people act for each other's benefits out of corrupt motives. And that's what capitalism makes possible. And the result is, or what the market makes possible, and the result is prosperity and progress, as it were. So Nicole is the beginning of that sort of argument that Hirschman is exploring. Now, I've come now to another Catholic moral philosopher, Alastair McIntyre. Alistair McIntyre started out as a Marxist, and then he became a Freudian, and then he wrote a book called After Virtue, and he became a Catholic. And it's the book After Virtue, which he published in 1981, which I'm interested in, because it presents the argument that I'm now presenting to you, which is that we live in a world in which we can no longer really talk about virtue. The language of virtue, McIntyre said, is simply a sort of wreckage that's been left behind by the tide of history. We still use it, but we no longer really know what it means. It's become an empty shell. It's become meaningless. We honor it in some sort of fashion, but we no longer inhabit it properly. And the difference between uh, Anscombe and uh, McIntyre is fundamentally that McIntyre wanted to date this moment of collapse. I imagine that in Anscombe's view, the moment of collapse began with the Reformation, but for McIntyre, who was new to Catholicism and wasn't so clear about this, the moment of collapse began with the Enlightenment. It began with Locke. It began with Pierre Bale. And one of the things that drove it, well, McIntyre doesn't emphasize this perhaps as much as he might have, but I've already hinted in it in what I said about Spinoza, was the notion of a science of man. The notion that we ought to be able to find laws that govern human behavior in the same way that the great Isaac Newton had found laws that governed the workings of the universe. And what Newton showed was that very complicated interactions could be reduced to very simple physical principles and mathematical principles. And those complicated interactions could be shown to be orderly when at first sight they seem to be entirely random or entirely disorderly. And that the movement of any one thing in the solar system would affect everything else. It would concatenate through the system. This becomes a model for how people want to think about society. The great philosopher David Hume later on says he's going to do an experimental science of ethics. Again, if you're going to have, it's like Spinoza saying he's going to do a physical science of ethics, an experimental science of ethics. You have to ask, is this ethics at all if it's an experimental science? He's going to do an experimental science of ethics modeled on what Newton had done. Mainly, he means he's going to do one that's grounded in experience, but grounded in experience in the sense of saying not what should people do, but what is it actually that people are doing when they're talking about right and wrong, good and bad, praising each other. And for McIntyre, I think, the man who sort of stands at the beginning of this collapse is John Locke. And John Locke is a, a complicated figure for us because on the one hand, we know about him through the two treatises of government, which are often said to be the foundation, one of the founding texts of the American revolutionary thinkers because they declare the rights of human beings and the right to revolution against tyranny. And that's fine. And that argument is utterly incompatible with the argument that Locke produces in the essay concerning human understanding, his great philosophical work of 1689 where he straightforwardly says that good is pleasure and evil is pain. That's all that they are. So if there is a divine order, it must be that in the end, God will reward certain things with pains and pleasures because in the divine economy, good can only be pleasure and pain, uh, evil can only be pain. My father was a clergyman, and I inherited his copy of Locke's essay concerning human understanding. And when he was reading this as a student, when he got to this passage, he couldn't bear it. He started scribbling in the margin wild things because he was so horrified by it. And McIntyre had that sense of horror, that this was not an ethical, incompatible with any form of ethical philosophy. And Locke insisted, that we always, he's one of the first people to use the notion of the pursuit of happiness. We're engaged in the pursuit of happiness, which fundamentally means we're engaged in the pursuit of pleasures. And happiness is simply a succession of pleasures. 
onto this we get grafted. I talked a little bit about how uh, Nicole was a follower of Augustine. And of course, the other great Augustinian tradition in the 17th century is that founded by John Calvin, Calvinism. And one of the great exponents of that tradition was a man called Pierre Bale, or Bell, if you try and pronounce it in French, who was nominally a Calvinist, though in fact it seems pretty clear he was some sort of atheist, wrote at great length demonstrating that all the arguments in favor of Christianity made no sense at all, and demonstrating that all the arguments produced by Spinoza in favor of pantheism held up remarkably well. Bale pursued the line of argument that we've heard of in Nicole, that people are fundamentally selfish and corrupt. And this also means, of course, that what we're really gifted at is hypocrisy. Think back to Machiavelli. What is politics about? It's about looking like one thing and being another. You invite your enemies into dinner, saying, I've got a really lovely meal for you. And then, as Cesare Borgia did, you strangle them. First, you've got to get them in, and then you turn and kill them. Hypocrisy is what makes politics work. And for the followers in this sort of tradition I'm talking about now, what makes social life possible is that we oil it with hypocrisy. And so Bale argued that this was so powerful a process that even people who didn't believe in Christianity, who didn't believe in God, would behave perfectly well in society because they'd worry about what other people thought about them. And they'd want other people to do business with them and promote them and be friends with them. And so they'd behave perfectly nicely, not because they were nice people at all or because they had good motives, but because they would be good at being hypocrites. Hypocrisy could hold society together entirely successfully. And this line of argument triumphs in England with a refugee from Holland called Bernard Mandeville or Bernard de Mandeville. I'm not showing you a picture of Bernard Mandeville because we have no picture of Bernard Mandeville. He was not successful enough for anyone ever to do a portrait of him. Nobody ever put a picture of him in the front of one of his books. We have no idea what he looked like. But he produced in 1705 a little book called The Grumbling Hive or Knaves Turned Honest. It's a poem in which he imagined what would happen if a world like ours is talking about bees, imaginary hive, but they're really people like us who are greedy and selfish and want to get rich and want to go to war and kill off other bees and so on, if they all turned religious, not just sort of Trump-type religious, but real religious. And suddenly, they would stop being greedy. They would stop working hard. They would no longer be interested in going to war. They would become quiet and peaceable and pacific and temperate and moderate, and another swarm of bees would come and kill them all very quickly, right? Catastrophic. Mandeville's argument, it's there in this reworking of 1723, which is a much longer version of the argument, is that private vices are public benefits. It's because we're greedy to get rich that society prospers. This becomes, in Adam Smith, the famous invisible hand argument. You're out for your interests, but we're all the better off for it because you make us all wealthy along with you. Accidentally, you don't mean to make everybody else rich, but as you get rich, we all get rich too. And so this line of thinking, for example, mainly I'm talking about English people uh, Scot and Scottish people, sorry, English-speaking people here, but... Um, this line of argument leads in a French philosopher Helvetius to what's said to be the first utilitarian text, which argues that we pursue pleasure. The important thing is that our pleasures should be made to fit in with other people's pleasures. The greatest pleasures of the greatest number is what you want. That's the only principle on which you can organize a society. And this becomes fundamentally the argument of David Hume in the treatise concerning human nature of 1738. Indeed, Hume actually says at one point that what he wants to say about morality, Hume says what morality consists of is doing those things uh, which are pleasurable or useful to yourself or to others. He says, 
you can get to exactly the same argument from Hobbes' premises. If you're a Hobbist, it's just a little more complicated. I don't agree with Hobbes because I think the welfare of other people matters to me. If I heard that Stuart had been involved in a car accident, I would feel sorry for him. I would feel pain. His unfortunate experience would cause me pain because I am a sympathetic human being. But let's note here that in the end, the reason I'm sorry about Stuart's car accident is because it hurts me. In the end here, this is a form of hedonistic selfishness. If Stuart could have car accidents that caused me no pain, I would no longer care what happened to him. I would be indifferent, which is what, how Hobbes assumed we would be. Hobbes quotes Lucretius. Lucretius said, this is so unbelievable, I have to stop and pause and breathe before I say it. Lucretius said, you can watch a ship being shipwrecked. And if you're standing on the shore, you think, hey, that's good. Because that's not happening to me. You can stand and see people, you can stand on the top of a castle and watch people killing each other in battle and you think, hey, this is wonderful, this isn't happening to me. Now, Hume says, oh no, you know, come on, that's not how we are. You'll think, oh, those poor things. I mean, imagine if that was me, it would be terrible. So Hume wants to add this layer of investment in others. But in the end, it's still about what you feel, how you feel. And of course, what we're working towards here is that great moral philosopher and economist, Adam Smith. It used to be argued that Smith had published two works, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was about virtue, and the uh, essay, uh, The Political Economy, which was about selfish behavior. But if you actually read the theory of moral sentiments, I'm, Stuart is going to get distressed in a moment. I, I feel sympathy for how he's going to feel when he hears me say this. If you actually read the theory of moral sentiments, there actually isn't very much virtue in it. What is prudence, Smith says? We should be prudent, he says. What is prudence? Prudence is those qualities that enable you to succeed, to get rich, to get powerful. Prudence is entirely instrumental. It's entirely consequentialist. It's entirely a strategy that you adopt to get to, the, to win the competition with others. It's a winning strategy in a Hobbesian game. In the whole of the theory of moral sentiments, which is about six or 700 pages long, Smith manages to mention charity, I think, twice. And rather strikingly, when Smith and Hume die, they leave no money to anybody apart from their close relatives. Hume is a little more complicated. He, he had, neither of them had children. Uh, so they're both leaving money to their nephews. Uh, Hume leaves this money to his nephew saying, if you don't fix the drains on the house within 18 months, that money will be taken away from you and it'll be given to the poor which is a sort of incentive for fixing the drains on the house, but it's, not a, it's very hard to see that as charity. As against, for example, Edmund Burke, who's often regarded as a hard-faced thinker, Burke believed very strongly that the, the poor needed charity, particularly in places like Ireland, where they were in danger of starvation. So all of this way of thinking leads to what I've been working up to in many ways leads to Bentham and utilitarianism. Bentham publishes his fragment on government in 1776, the same year as Smith publishes his political economy, his wealth of nations, the same year as the great declaration of independence, which declares that we have a right to the pursuit of happiness, a phrase that's been used over and over again over the previous hundred years, and which embodies this notion that we are fundamentally out for ourselves. Now, of course, if you run this line of argument, a lot of very sensible people, and some not so sensible people, protest against it. You don't have to wait for Elizabeth Anscombe and Alistair McIntyre. You can have, for example, John Wesley, converted to a new form of Christianity in 1738, condemning 
the philosophy of his contemporaries. Or you can have Arnold of rugby, as we like to call him in England, uh, because he was a headmaster of rugby school. And Arnold's belief was that if you took young men and made them play sports in cold weather and things like that, what you would do is you would develop their character. They'd go on to fight well in battles and govern the empire, and they would become Aristotelian virtuous men. In that sense, he was still trying to uphold an Aristotelian idea of virtue. Or you can take John Stuart Mill. Mill had been brought up by his father, who was a Benthamite, to pursue pleasure and flee pain, but he'd been told that it was his duty, though the term was rather obscure for a utilitarian, to look after the welfare of others as well as of himself. And when he was a young man, about 24, Mill has a nervous breakdown. He can't understand what, what's to motivate him in life. Where is the pleasure going to come from if he's always doing things for other people? He reads a story by Mom and Tell. I'm sorry to say this as a father. He reads a story by Mom and Tell on the death of a father. He weeps and he becomes much happier because he's imagined living outside the shadow of his domineering dad. And he gets up and he starts saying, look, there are different sorts of pleasures. There are the pleasures that pigs like, good food, wallowing, and there's listening to Shakespeare, or listening to music, or there's reading Aristotle. And there are different qualities of pleasure, and it's therefore fundamentally important that you don't just pursue pleasure, that you pursue the higher pleasures rather than the lower pleasures. Of course, if you then go and ask someone like John Stuart Mill how he knows which the higher pleasures are, it becomes a little more complicated. So what I'm trying to argue is that there is a sort of slope, you know, slippery slope plus argument are dangerous arguments because they're often untrue, but there is a slippery slope which begins with, let's say, Machiavelli, and that leads, for example, to Ayn Rand who publishes Atlas Shrugged in 1957. A line of argument which says we are necessarily, fundamentally selfish human beings, that we are only concerned with our own welfare, that our own welfare consists in pleasure, that what happens to other people is no real concern of ours. But it's quite fortunate that if we pursue our own welfare intelligently, other people will do all right too, because the economy will see to that. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with my argument up to now. You may not be, but I'm, I'm all right so far. But we come to my last, my last slide, which is a slide of Martha Nussbaum, who's a professor here in, in Chicago. And we get to the point where I get nervous about what I really think. Because I, I'm a great admirer of her work, but I see what her effort is being to prove Elizabeth Anscombe and Alistair McIntyre wrong and to say we can still rebuild a virtue ethics in the modern world. An ethics that's relevant to real human experience of our day, to questions of feminism, for example, to questions of underdevelopment, to questions of climate change. And we can do that by reworking and rethinking Aristotle particularly. She's really a sort of Aristotelian. Well, McIntyre, and Anscombe had said, we can't bring Aristotle back unless we bring back the intellectual pre preconditions for Aristotle, which in their case meant bringing back St. Thomas, bringing back Catholicism. And I want to just take a, a phrase of Martha Nussbaum's and tell you why I think I disagree with it so that you will see whether or, you can judge for yourselves whether I'm right or wrong. Her first big book is about what she calls the fragility of goodness. And the fragility of goodness consists in the fact that we often set out to do the right thing, but we fail. Let's take our example of courage. A courageous army can go to battle, can I even have a good general, but it can be defeated. And it can end up as a result, its, it's home city can be pillaged, its women sold into slavery, its children sold into slavery, the whole city destroyed. So even the best people can find themselves faced with the worst outcomes. Now, 
if you stop and think about this, you don't learn from this that goodness is fragile which is what I think Nussbaum claims you should learn from this. Courage isn't fragile. Human beings are fragile. You go on the battlefield, you discover you're fragile. But there's nothing fragile about courage. Courage is robust. The virtues are not fragile. It's the people who embody them who are fragile. Or take another, what she regards as a central moral problem. Uh, you're on the battlefield. Stuart and I are fighting side by side. Stuart gets wounded. I don't know why Stuart is doing very badly this afternoon. I apologize for this. <laughs> Usually I have some poor student I'm doing this to, and it's all even worse. Um, but he at least can, can, can handle it, I'm sure. Stuart gets wounded, and of course Stuart is my good friend, and I want to pick him up and carry him off the battlefield and rescue his life. Because I know that if I don't do this, he will die. Now, if I'm a proper Aristotelian citizen, I do not for a moment hesitate. I turn away from Stuart and I march forward and leave him to die. This is very unlucky for Stuart. It's very painful for me. I will spend the rest of my life grieving this terrible thing that has happened to me, but I will not for a moment think that I made the wrong choice because it's very clear what the hierarchy here is. As far as Aristotle is concerned, courage trumps friendship. The obligations to the city are superior to the personal obligations that friends have to each other. So in this case, too, we don't have some sort of tragic choice I mean, in the way that Berlin thought we had tragic choices. Am I going to be a good citizen or am I going to be a good friend? According to Aristotle, there's no tragic choice here. That's a terrible outcome. But the choice is simple. So here again, virtue isn't fragile. Virtue isn't easily broken up. Virtue isn't in pieces, virtue is simple. What's difficult is being virtuous. So what I would argue against Martha Nussbaum and her heroic efforts to reestablish a virtue ethics is that they involve all the time actually smuggling back in anxieties that Aristotle never had. When Aristotle talked about courage, he didn't think that you ought to be able to guarantee that courage would work. But Nussbaum is anxious about the fact that as a strategy, courage isn't always a successful strategy. She's looking at it from a consequentialist point of view. She's looking at it from a utilitarian point of view. She can't help it even when she's trying not to. And when Aristotle talked about the fact that you couldn't judge whether a person was happy until after they had died, because they might die in some dreadful fashion, and that would mean that you'd have to rethink their whole life, Aristotle wasn't saying you couldn't tell whether they were virtuous until after they were lied, died. Virtue was something that you could really display on a day-to-day -day basis in your going about the world. It's just the outcome that was uncertain. Human beings are fragile, outcomes are fragile, but goodness itself is not. So I would argue that Martha Nussbaum is more of a consequentialist than she wants to be. And while she's trying, like some sort of rocket firing off into the stratosphere to escape the gravitational pull of Hobbesian consequentialism, she actually keeps falling back down to earth. And so what I want to say about virtue is virtue has disappeared to a significant extent from our world. We are no longer good at talking about virtue. We're no longer good at talking about the thing that underpins virtue, which is character. We're no longer good at living lives of virtue. We no longer understand what it might be to live a life of virtue. And one of the interesting questions is, what would have to change in order for us to recover some of that? Now, Anscombe and McIntyre said the answer is become a Catholic. That's not an answer available to me. That's not an answer I recommend to you, though it's an answer that very sophisticated and intelligent people have found entirely satisfactory. But if that's not the answer, then the question is, what sort of answer is there? How would our world have to change in order for us to recover a meaningful concept of virtue? And that's the question I want to leave you with, because I'll be absolutely honest, it's a question to which I do not have the answer. Thank you. <laughs>
we have time for a few question and answers. If anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand and a microphone will find its way to you. Right here in the front. Thank you. With regards to virtue, could you speak about our current president? Ah. <laughs> I did use his name once. Um, I, I, th I think that isn't something I would really want to do, I mean, because I don't see this as a political occasion, except to go back to what I said about Machiavelli, which is to say that modern politics as conceived of, before Machiavelli, everybody had argued, very straightforwardly, that the good person would be the good ruler and the good leader, that virtue would in the end pay off because a good leader would be successful at leading his people, he'd win loyalty and affection and so on. And Machiavelli turns around and says, this isn't how it works. The successful people are often the nastiest people. And I think we live in a Machiavellian world. And sometimes that is more obvious than at other times. Sometimes we get people who look pretty good and behave pretty well and are really in some ways quite satisfactory. And other times it's very obvious that we're dealing with people who say one thing and mean another, promise one thing and do another, and, and that's uh, a catastrophic character of modern politics. Uh, and the only way in which you can try and change this is by creating very powerful political and legal and social norms, which we, to some degree, have had. And which, in, not just in America, but elsewhere in my country as well, uh, we seem to be losing, I think. We've got our last two questions back here. I'm sorry, we're running a little tight on time. Yeah. Aren't, uh, aren't people really a jumble of different uh, characteristics, uh, some virtue as well as selfishness? And uh, doesn't uh, what comes out in a person influence much by uh, the beliefs in society or the influences on that person? Uh, yes, I think uh, there's a sense in which uh, this is, you're asking a, 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 pa a pa powerfully important and complicated question. Um, and, and I would need another hour, I think, to try and get a good grip on it. Um, Aristotle and Locke and everybody here I'm talking about understands that we are the product of our, of our upbringing. And um, mainly the word they use for this is education. So Locke writes a handbook on how to educate children. Arnold of Rugby sets up, uh, reforms his public school and so on. In that sense, we are the product of an upbringing. But the question is, what values do we instill it through our upbringing? And the values that Locke is set instilling in small children through his upbringing are, are primarily values of, of the pursuit of success and pleasure. Um, they're very different from the values that Arnold of Rugby tried to instill in young men, very different from the values Aristotle tried and failed to instill in Alexander. Alexander is a wonderful example of someone who was a bad pupil. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think if, if, if what you're saying is, um, Individuals aren't responsible. Culture and society is, is in large part responsible. That's certainly right. But on the other hand, we work on changing our own selves and our own societies for the better. Uh, and this is an enterprise which we carry on. I mean, I believe, you see, Locke, uh, Hobbes says we pursue pleasure throughout our lives. I also believe that we actually, throughout our lives, we make some small effort to improve ourselves in other ways. And, and that seems to be important. This will be our last question, but afterwards we are having a book signing in the back. So if you'd like to pick up a book and then head over to the signing and ask a question, that would be great. So, so you left us with a really provocative question. And I was just wondering, you know, in considering what would have to change, what is it that, I guess I want to know from you, what, what is the reason that you think we should change to a system of virtue? Ah. The best questions come last. Um, I suppose because I fundamentally think that Aristotle is right, that if you want to have, uh, that there is a form of happiness that comes with living a life well, which is different and better from the form of happiness which comes from merely succeeding in life. And in that sense, I think that virtue is its own reward ought to be its own reward, and that we would be happier. That we, it's very easy if you live a life of constant competition and struggle uh, 
actually to discover that the re rewards of that are very shallow and unsatisfactory, I think. And, in, and that's, I suppose, what I want to say. And so I think that what has happened over the last two or 300 years, if we set in motion a world, a concept of our society as being one of constant struggle, in which the rewards are financial and, and pleasurable and resource-based. And so if you want to ask how would we get out of that, well, I think there is actually one answer that strikes one immediately, which is that if what's driven the modern social change and modern, the failure of moral philosophy in the modern world is this competition for resources, which is fundamentally what underlies the Hobbesian view of the world, then if we were to move into a world where resources cease to be in short supply, our whole culture and our whole morality would automatically and necessarily change radically. Now, it isn't impossible that we would move into such a world, right? I mean, if we had fusion nuclear power, we could have free electricity. If we had uh, genuine artificial intelligence robots doing a lot of the work for us, we would no longer be wage slaves. So it isn't actually impossible that one can imagine a world where our value system is no longer driven by resource poverty, which is, I think, what drives our present value system. Didn't drive the value system of Aristotle, didn't drive the value system of St. Thomas, because they took resource poverty for granted. But as you move into the post-Machiavellian world, there's a struggle to do something about it, which is to compete to improve, which we've actually done very successfully. We've been very good at that struggle. We've created prosperity. But what we haven't created is happiness, it seems to me. Uh, and so in that sense, the simplest logical fix, but actually the hardest one to actually achieve, would be to escape from resource poverty, at which point people would have to say, what is it I'm actually doing anything for? What are my motives? What are my passions? What are my interests? In a way that in a world in which keeping food on the table, keeping a roof over your head, you often never stop and ask that question. That's what I think. Thank you.